Great. Good morning. The lost art of software design. I'm going to start with a quote. Big design up front is dumb. Doing no design up front is even dumber. This is what this session is all about. And this really epitomizes what I've seen over the past 18 or so years uh, in the software world since the Adam Manifesto was created. I'm going to use the word design a number of times, and I want to caveat everything I'm about to say. So when I use the word design, I'm talking about technical design. So not product design like product vision and UI and UX and all of that really, really interesting, good stuff that should definitely be done. But I'm talking about the stuff that underlies it from a technical perspective. So choosing tech, modularity, and so on and so forth. You might have seen this cartoon by Henrik Nieberg. This is one of the ways that people teach minimum viable products, iterative design, incremental design, development, and so on and so forth. I like this. This makes sense from a product perspective, throwing something out there that's quick and easy to create, get some feedback, iterate, and evolve. And that works for product design. But the thing nobody talks about is you don't just go build a car. Right, step five. And in fact, all of these steps are major re-engineering efforts, and we kind of don't focus on that stuff so much. On a similar note, and also, this time, it's going to be different. Yeah, right. For those who don't know me, my name is Simon Brown. I was here last year. I'm the author of a couple of software architecture books. In my past, I've written some Java books. I'm an independent uh, consultant specializing in software architecture. One of the things I get to do is I get to travel around the world, and I get to run architecture workshops. Some of these are design workshops, and some of them are diagramming workshops. And for the uh, kind of design and, and diagramming stuff, I give groups of about three or four people some requirements, like you see here, a nice simple set of requirements. And I say, go away for like an hour and a half, do some collaborative design, come up with a solution for this, and then draw some diagrams to describe your solution. And it's worded like that. So it's quite vague, and I don't offer much assistance. The output from this exercise tends to look like that, or that, boxes and no lines, the functional view. <laughs> yeah, that's London Heathrow. <laughs> We're going to have something that does business logic. Well, thank you. Diagrams and no tech choices. Lots of C-sharp things floating around a database. An adventure game. <laughs> Diagrams to stormtroopers on. Or just a general mess. These are some of the more extreme examples of the diagrams that we tend to get. And I'm obviously using these for a reason. So let me show you a real set of diagrams from a workshop I did earlier this year. So these are a, a bit more reasonable. Kind of looks OK, doesn't it? One of the things I get groups to do is to switch diagrams and rate uh, the diagrams on a scale between 1 and 10. What sort of score do you think you'd give this? Shout me out a couple of numbers quickly. 8, 7, 7, 7. Yeah, so other people thought, yeah, this sort of describes the system and the solution. We'll give it a seven. This one, very different, also a seven. This one, this one has some tech choices and it's got layered things, also a seven. <laughs> you see a, a theme here. This one here, guess what? Yep. <laughs> this one here. This one here, eight. Come on, seven. <laughs> this one here, six. <laughs> What's funny about this one is I think this is actually one of the most detailed diagrams, but because of the detail, people are like, oh, that's complicated, so we'll, we'll, we'll kind of downgrade it. Um, I guess it, it's at this point we should say, well, you know, what's wrong with these diagrams? And one of the things I get groups to do is, is switch the diagrams, and I want you to review the diagrams that you're now looking at, which you've had no input in creating, 
do an architecture review. Do you think the diagrams, do you think that the designs satisfy the solution? And if you were the customer, the bank in this case, would you buy the solution? And of course, nobody can answer these questions because they can't see the solution. They, because the diagrams are so crazy, they just can't see what's going on, so they can't review it. And that's what's leading me to all of this stuff. So I'm going to cover a bunch of different topics and themes related to this stuff here. I have no academic background in any of this. I've done no formal research. So all of this is based upon me traveling around the world, running this workshop. So this is all very anecdotal. Obviously, there's some confirmation bias here. Teams who know how to do things are not going to get me in. Um, but I, I have a decent amount of experience. So I, I've run this workshop in over 30 countries, and well over 10,000 people have done this exercise. So we've got some quite good data points here. And it's everything from little startups to unicorn startups that you'll be familiar with, to multinational companies and everybody in between. So a lot of the, the stuff I'm going to talk about, lots of this is actually coming from household names. So let's talk about UML first. <laughs> because those diagrams were not UML, were they? So why are people not using UML anymore? Well, there's a book about this. And the book is called 97 Ways to Sidestep UML. And it's by a friend of mine, an Irish friend called No Formality. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to have to work with me on this. I've got some more. So excuse number one for people not using UML, I don't know it. Yeah, that's quite common. Number two, not everybody knows it. Uh, or I'm the only person on the team who knows it. So UML knowledge in general is kind of decreasing. Uh, it's also a generational issue here. Universities realize we don't use it, so they're not teaching it, so on and so forth. Who uses UML here? Quick show of hands. There's like a s tiny scattering. Uh, when I ask this question, it's kind of in the 10% range, which is, is about right here. Um, there are some exceptions to this. Germany and the Netherlands, higher percentage. <laughs> Why are you laughing? They probably do stuff better than we do. Um, but I'm also seeing lots, in fact, most organizations I, I visit now have nobody who knows UML or even uses it. And sometimes when you kind of drill into this, it's like, yeah, we just use class diagrams and sequence diagrams, so yeah. Um, you'll be seen as old was actually given to me, generally given to me earlier this year as an excuse for not using UML. I promise I have not made that up. I was literally stunned. It was shortly followed by someone else on the same team saying that. You'll be seen as old-fashioned. I'm like, come on. This is really fascinating me because this particular organization is quite a young organization. And, and for me, this kind of suggests some deep-rooted cultural issues. Um, and, and that's just tragic. We don't want to tell developers what to do is a reason for not using UML. What? It turns out when we throw away big design up front in like 2000-something, we also threw away a whole bunch of other stuff, including UML. And, and, and genuinely, th this was said to me quite recently, the team said, if we, if we use UML, that seems like we're telling developers what to do. And they kind of coupled UML with big upfront design. And I'm like, no, they're totally different things. One's just a notation, one's a process. Uh, the tooling sucks. Yep, <laughs> I'd agree with that. Uh, it's too detailed. Yeah, UML is very detailed, very precise. Yeah. Black diamond versus white diamond. No one knows what that means. It's a very elaborate waste of time. So. No one's actually said this to me, but this guy has said it publicly on YouTube. <laughs> so, you know, what's the alternative? Well, let's just use a whiteboard. No, we know how this works. I've literally been traveling the world and looking at whiteboard diagrams for like 10 years, and, and they're appallingly bad. And it's because we're not doing engineering, we're just doing some artistic nonsense that you know, half the stuff doesn't make sense. Um, another reason why people don't use UML, it's not expected in Agile. What? Like the Agile Manifesto does not talk about UML in the slightest. Like, why would it? UML is a tool in a toolbox. Where does this come from? Lots of the original material around Agile kind of says stuff like this. Uh, you know, would it be better if we use a case tool to lay out our designs? No, just use a whiteboard or a bar napkin. OK, <laughs> fair enough. Um, you might need some, well, some uh, 
nicely formatted UML for your project. And then this is interesting, but inside your co-located whole team, you probably just need conversation. Oh, I hear this a lot. We don't need to figure out what we're doing and use complex notations because the value is in the conversation. Oh, I hate this. It drives me batty. <laughs> because people say, well, hang on a second, those diagrams, you know, all the diagrams are potentially excellent if you have a good conversation in front of them. There's, there's some truth there. So you can have the worst set of diagrams in the world, but as long as you understand them in your, in your whole team, maybe that's sufficient. The problem is, you can only have the right conversations if you can see what you're doing. And something I've witnessed is that because the diagrams are so open to misinterpretation, teams and individuals on teams are having the wrong conversations. They're not asking the right questions. And that leads me on to superficial upfront design. So something I see a lot during my workshops is, so it's a 90 minute exercise, the requirements are really simple. I see lots of people jumping on a solution and not really thinking through the intricacies of the solution and then stopping. In extreme cases, teams will say, here's a box representing the thing we've asked us to build, and now we're agile, we're going for coffee. <laughs> and they won't kind of elaborate any more detail. That doesn't happen often. What I do find happens often is this. So you get very high-level superficial diagrams, kind of the logical view, the conceptual view, the functional view of, of components and things and services and how they relate. And people have not really thought through how this is actually going to be implementable. And, and you can attribute this to the, the kind of typical S-curve of learning. So when we get a problem for the first time, it's slow. We have to do lots of workshopping and collaboration, asking questions and exploring and analysis. And, and if people are stopping here, they're missing out on all of the accelerated learning. So I want to spend a little bit more time to get us a bit more higher on this curve. That's really the goal of doing some upfront thinking. So what sort of things, what sort of pitfalls are organizations and teams falling into? You know, what mistakes are they making when they're doing the, their design? There's a book about this. It's called 97 Questions to Ask Before Coding by Assam Shun. We're getting there. I have better ones. I do apologize. So what programming language should we use? I see a number of teams doing my exercise, and they draw a bunch of boxes, and they don't put tech choices on. And then you have some really interesting conversations during the, during the review session where you say people, you know, you, you kind of hear people saying, well, I didn't realize we were using Java. I thought it was PHP. And people are looking at the solution with their eyes, with their experience, and kind of superimpose their tech choices on the solution. And teams are not reaching consensus. They're not even talking about the technology solutions. The same goes with microservices. Because people are drawing these very high-level sets of boxes and services and, and links between them, a lots of people kind of misinterpret that as a microservices architecture. Or a monolith. And for a number of times, I've seen people drawing these very high-level diagrams, and one person thinks it's, it's stuff in a monolith, and another person thinks it's a set of microservices. And again, they've not had this discussion. I see lots of diagrams with cylinders on the universal symbol for a database. And then someone else on the group will go, well, I didn't think we were using a database. They're like, no, it's a, it's a data store, not a database. And again, they're not having these conversations. They're jumping to assumptions. Why is the ORM connected to the Angular front end? It's a bit of a specific one, but um, bear with me a second. So here's an example diagram. There's an Angular front end at the top with a report, view, uh, report viewer. There's a back end here, which is uh, ASP.NET, and there's an entity framework ORM. And there's a line between the ORM and something in the Angular front end. I'm like, how do you do that? <laughs> like, oh, yeah, we hadn't thought that through. Thank you. Um, another one, is the web UI getting data from Amazon S3? So somebody once drew a diagram, and they had a box labeled web front end and a box labeled S3 with an arrow between the two. So I said, is your web UI getting data from S3? They said, yes. So I said, what's your web UI? They said, it's an Angular app running in a browser. And I said, right, so it's client side in a browser. Yes. And it's talking to S3. Yes. How? Now, oh, there's a, 
a Node.js library that we can you know, use the Amazon S3 API from. I'm like, OK, but where are you putting your S3 credentials in the client side of that? They're like, oh, yeah, that's silly, isn't it? <laughs> and again, they're not kind of not thinking these things through. So that leads me on to tech decisions. Uh, and there's a book about this. Surprise, surprise. It's called 97 Ways to Defer Your Technology Decisions by Ina Duncoden. Yeah, that's really poor, isn't it? Number one, we don't have enough detail. So one of the reasons people cite for not putting tech choices on diagrams and not thinking through tech choices is because they don't think they have enough detail. In many cases, they could just ask for more detail, but they don't want to do that for some reason. We don't solutionize. The number of times I hear this is just astounding. Shortly followed by, we don't solutionize this early. I'm like, the whole point of the exercise is to do design and come up with a solution. And now you're telling me you're not creating a solution, like you're missing part of the whole thing. Um, in larger organizations, I hear people say this, our architects are not allowed to do solutioneering. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> OK. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Nobody actually said this. <laughs> But sometimes people are doing this design exercise, and they, and they generally don't know what they're doing, and they're kind of afraid to reach out for help. We don't want to imp impose a solution upon the development team. And like the whole point of, of doing design is to create a solution that we're going to actually go and build, and the development team needs to be part of this. So again, maybe there's some thinking here where we're stuck in the old-fashioned way of handing over, and maybe we do need to do something more collaborative. Um, similarly, we leave developers to choose the implementation details, like choice of language and whether it's going to be microservices or monoliths. Those are not implementation details. Those are significant decisions that we kind of need to nail down fairly early. Um, likewise with this, the team should choose the implementation strategy. All of these things are exact quotes of, of what people have said to me in these workshops. One of the other reasons that people cite for not putting tech choices on diagrams is because of things like this. You know, We're a Java team, so it's obviously a Java solution. Well, not to me, eh? <laughs> and what I've noticed over the years is there's this interesting uh, conflict between people producing architecture diagrams and people consuming them. So in many times, the, the creators and the producers of the diagrams don't want to put tech choices on the diagrams for a whole bunch of reasons. But when you're looking at a set of architecture diagrams from the other side, those diagrams are often hard to understand precisely because they don't have tech choices on there. And so there's this interesting conflict. Uh, this next one is my, my most hated phrase in the whole of Agile. We wait until the last responsible moment. Because people completely misinterpret this, and they wait too long, and guess what? That's gone. So this leads me on to upfront design. And I hear a number of teams and individuals give me excuses for not doing any upfront design. And there's a book about this. It's called 97 Strategies to Avoid Upfront Design by Vera Gile. You have to say her name in a German accent. Vera Gile. Are we allowed to do upfront design if we are agile? I've generally had teams ask me this question, and it's just saddening. You know, ag agile teams are supposed to be self organizing and autonomous and cross functional, and they're supposed to make their own decisions. And yet, they're having to ask someone like me, like, are we allowed to do upfront design if we're doing Agile? That's, that's nuts. We don't do upfront design because we do extreme programming instead. What? Again, I, I've generally had XP, te XP teams um, cite this to me. They're like, when we get a requirement in from our business people, we just like open our laptops and start coding. I'm like, how does that work out for you? Well, we have to do lots of refactoring because we don't get it right first time. Yes. If you sat down for like an hour over a coffee and had a, some discussion, maybe do a little bit of upfront thinking, you might not run into those issues. You might actually be more effective. We're agile, so we don't do upfront design. And <laughs> it's not expected in agile. Again, same thing with UML. And again, where did this sort of thing come from? Well, again, if you go look up some of the literature around agile and extreme programming, look, there's no big design up front. The design activity is iterative and incremental and evolutionary. Uh, Martin Fowler on his, on his Blicky um, said this a number of years ago. You know, some of the more aggressive XPers are putting kind of effort into avoiding making those upfront decisions. 
And you can see this with ports and adapters and clean architecture and deferring technology decisions and decoupling and things like this. And of course, that's all good, but sometimes you do need to do some upfront thinking. How much? Maybe I'm, I'm good with a one, <laughs> one day of design for a, a one year effort thing. Maybe that's fine. Maybe that's too much. Maybe that's not enough. So again, we can't start throwing numbers around because there's no context here. And what, one of my big issues is when you go and look for information about you know, how do we uh, tackle the upfront design process with agility in mind, you'll find that a lot of the kind of luminaries around Agile don't say much about this topic. And of course, it's very easy to jump to assumptions based on what people are not saying. So because, of, because the people behind the Agile Manifesto are not saying, by the way, you should do some upfront thinking, we mistake that as the Agile people are saying we should not do some upfront thinking. Uh, and that's sad as well. I actually had someone said this to me once. I was there kind of promoting upfront design and thinking, and they actually said to me, well, I guess you are not a programmer, which I thought was a little bit offensive, <laughs> because they thought I was just one of these people that kind of comes in and draws boxes and waves my hands and, and runs away, but I, I am a programmer. I, I have a startup, and I've built all the stuff myself. So yeah, I've kind of gone through this from my own perspective. The thing we have to remember here, of course, is that the people who created the Agile Manifesto have a lot of experience in doing software development. I mean, I've been doing software development for over 20 years now, and I, I still don't think I have enough, uh, as much experience as they did 20 years ago. And we forget that. You know, because most teams are made up of much younger people, there's a generational thing here. And we may have missed a lot of that knowledge, that sharing, that context, that experience. I always wondered, uh, hypothetically, what would happen if you took one of the Agile Manifesto authors out of the software world? Would they be comfortable tackling new problems in an Agile way? And then this happened on Twitter, which I was amazed about. So Ken Beck, he said, I've got some free time. I'm now going to start writing a book I've already had in mind. And he, t he took a photo of the outline of this book he wanted to create and write. And you know what's coming, don't you? Somebody said, well, why, why are you creating an outline first? Why are you not kind of writing and refactoring? Fair comment, given these people are kind of pushing the just write code and refactor. To write a book, I need to see a hole to, to reduce my anxiety. Yeah, that's why I do upfront design, because I'm not an expert, and I, I know I'm going to get some stuff wrong. So I want to increase my level of confidence that my solution is going to work. And again, that's why I want to see the whole picture before I start diving into lots of the intricate details here. And so, so one of the things we're really missing here is a toolbox of stuff. And if you want to move fast as a team, if you want to be agile, and if you want to have agility as an organization, you need a good toolbox of techniques and practices. And so there's not a one-size-fits-all answer to any of this. And sometimes you have to take different tools out of the toolbox depending on what you're doing. But the problem here is we've, we've stopped teaching a lot of this stuff. So we've stopped teaching UML. We've stopped teaching you know, architecture diagramming in many cases. We've stopped teaching people how they should think about design. So what's the process for doing design? And that's a fun question to ask. Next time you're back in your office with, the, with your friends and colleagues, ask them this question. So how do you folks do design? If someone comes to your desk and says, I'd like you to build a thing, like, what do you do next? Because they'll sit there and go, hmm, that's an interesting question. Never really thought that through. And then ultimately, somebody will say, well, what we do is we, um, we go grab a meeting room, and we use a whiteboard. Right. And you know, I can't get code out of a whiteboard, so what are you using the whiteboard for? And they're like, well, we draw boxes and lines. Like, right. How? What are the boxes representing? Well, the boxes represent components. Oh no, what's a component? How you come out with components? Why are you drawing three boxes, not four? What's your decomposition strategy? And, and people are not able to answer this question. And in the end, they say, okay, we give up. We just use our experience. <laughs> this is what we're doing, but we've totally forgotten how to articulate the process we're going through. And, and the reason I think this is important is because if we're doing pair architecting, so imagine I'm at the whiteboard, and I have an apprentice working with me who's fresh out of university. 
and I'm there doing some design, drawing some boxes, using my experience, and my printer says to me, Simon, you've just drawn three boxes with lines between them. Why did you draw that set of three boxes and not two boxes or four boxes or five boxes? And I say, I, I'm using my experience, and I just carry on and ignore them. It's not a great way to coach and mentor and teach people. Agile talks about good design. Agile talks about good architecture. And, and again, if we go back to the, you know, 15 years ago when Agile was in its infancy, there was lots of people kind of saying, Agile is here, and architecture is here, and design is here, and that all of these things are totally incompatible. But if you can be bothered to click through to page two of the Manifesto website, which a lot of people don't for some reason, you've got the principles. I think this set of principles should be the Agile Manifesto front page, because there's far more insightful stuff here about the background behind the Agile Manifesto. So continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. The other way to think about this is a good architecture allows you to move fast. So if you have a horrible big ball of mud, messy code base, we know when you change something here, all of this stuff breaks, and you're not really sure why it shouldn't, but it does. And that slows you down. If you have a good architecture, and you know, good is very subjective, but for me, good is about good modularity. It's about having good boundaries around things. It's about isolating change. It's about isolating volatility. So when you change something up here, that change is isolated and doesn't have this horrible ripple effect. And guess what? That doesn't come for free. Unless you've got tons and tons of experience and you just do the right thing naturally, for the rest of us, we have to do some thinking because there's never a single right answer. George Fairbanks has a great book on architecture called Just Enough Software Architecture. And he says a good architecture really happens through architecture in different design. And, and what he means by this is just jumping on a solution because that's what we've always done, or because of trend, hype, and fashion. And I'm not going to single anything out here apart from microservices and serverless. Sorry. <laughs> I do. I see lots of, pe lots of teams jumping on microservices for all the wrong reasons. They think it's going to give them scale and agility, and guess what? It's going to slow you down if you don't know what you're doing. So upfront design is important. We need to do some thinking. And I think many people have the wrong interpretation of what upfront design really means. I think a lot of people see it about the perfect end state, the blueprints, the rigid goal we're going for. And I think that's wrong. I think upfront design is, is not about creating that stuff. It's not, create, it's not about creating our perfect end state. It's about something else. I showed you the Henrik Niebuhr cartoon with the scooter against the car. Skateboard going to the car. There's another version. I kind of like this one a, a bit more. It's called Evolutionary Design. There's a blog post by Josh Kirievsky, subtitled Beginning with the Primitive Hole. And it's the same thing. It's the imagine we want to deliver a guitar and all sing and all dance in guitar. Let's ship version one, which sounds horrible, but let's get some feedback and iterate. And again, we've done this to death. We all know about the MVP iteration stuff. So why am I talking about it? Because no one talks about that first version. Right, in order to ship the first version, you need to do some technical design. You need to, in this case, think about materials and extension points for the future. And you don't just jump on the solution using the first material that you come across. So for me, upfront design is about creating a good starting point and having a direction, having a vision. And Sandro said this first thing this morning, you know, that vision might change, and our direction to get to that vision might change once we start getting feedback. And that's fine, right? I, I'm happy for an architecture, for a design to change, but let's do this in a justified, conscious manner. The other thing that's important for me about um, leaving some time for doing upfront design, and again, you'll see the same themes echoed from Sandro's talk here, is that we're trying to figure out some of the unknown unknowns. So when people jump into my, uh, my little kind of architecture diagram in Carter exercise, they often jump on the solution and they stop thinking, because, yeah, we're done, we think it's going to work. But if you go a little bit further, you might start to find that actually this is not feasible or we've completely missed something. And again, you need to expend a little bit of your brain energy to figure that stuff out. The essence of what I'm talking about is you're at the whiteboard, you're doing some design. You need to be able to answer two key questions. Number one, 
do the diagrams to reflect what we think we're going to build? And number two, is it going to work? In order to answer these two questions, you need to do some thinking, you need to do some design. And it's not that we're trying to make every decision. Big design up front from, from times gone by, we would decide everything, often very speculatively. And it's wasteful. So that's not what we're trying to do here. And I want to make this very explicit because the last time I did this talk, I did this whole talk, and then one of the questions at the end was, it sounds like you want us to, to reintroduce big design up front. I'm like, no. Off your phone and listen to what I'm saying. So we need to do some thinking, not all of the thinking. There's a bunch of stuff that we should decide and a bunch of stuff that can quite happily evolve. And really, it's about significant decisions. This is a great quote by Grady Booch. He says, architecture is about significant decisions, where significance is measured by cost of change. So there are some decisions that we sometimes unknowingly make early that become hard to change. So if you're building a bunch of Java apps, guess what? You're stuck with Java. If you're building a monolithic application, guess what? You're stuck with a monolithic application. If you're going to defer and decouple all, your, all of your technology choices through a hexagonal architecture, guess what? You're stuck with a monolithic hexagonal architecture. If you jump on a set of microservices, guess what? You've got a set of microservices. It's hard to merge those things into monoliths. So some of the very early key decisions that we make, we, we do so unconsciously. So key decisions, significant decisions, high-level tech choices, choice of programming language, any frameworks or APIs or tech that becomes embedded in the thing you're building, your overall strategy about modularity. Is it microservices? Is it monoliths? Is it a hybrid approach, something in between? And then there's a whole bunch of other things that we really don't care too much about at this level. So let's not spend four hours figuring out where we're going to put our curly braces, right? I don't care. Martin Fowler said this years ago. Again, you can find this on this blicky. I think there's a role for a broad starting point architecture. Such things as stating early how to layer the application and how you in interact with a database if you're going to have a database. So again, making some of those core tech choices, the things that once, they've, once they're in there, they become hard to change later. So be wary of, we should just use a whiteboard and have nice conversations, because that doesn't always get you to where you want to go. It doesn't help you answer some of these two questions. And it doesn't help you answer some of these uh, questions because we don't have a ubiquitous language to describe what we want to describe. And that's one of the big problems here. Some of these diagrams were just horrible and so in open to interpretation that you really had no idea what was going on. How do we fix this? Use UML. Right, you could do. There's nothing stopping any of you right now going and learning UML and applying it to your work and coming up with something that's formalized and structured, et cetera, et cetera. And that solves a bunch of communication issues. But people don't want to do that for a whole bunch of reasons. So I created something called the C4 model. And you can find more information about this on c4model.com. And it's a set of abstractions um, regarding architecture and thinking about architecture in different ways. And accompanying the C4 model is a set of diagrams that kind of mirror those abstractions. And it's really having a set of diagrams that act as a set of maps on top of your code base that allow, to, uh, allow you to zoom in and zoom out of the solution from different levels of abstraction. And these different levels of diagrams, they're relatively straightforward to put together. Um, they're notation independent. So I'm not teaching a notation. I'm teaching a set of abstractions. And the different levels of diagrams allow you to have different conversations. They allow you to ask different questions and see different facets and aspects of your solution space and really challenge it and review it. And one of the things, so I like to talk about diagrams a lot. I'll definitely grant you that. I apologize in advance. But for me, diagrams are a fantastic visual checklist for your design decisions. So your diagrams don't capture the decision-making process, the diagrams capture the essence of the decisions, the end point that you've reached. So I definitely recommend you know, recording your decisions, architecture decision records, however you want to do it. But the diagrams are a great way to you know, use it as a checklist. The top two diagrams of the C4 model, the first one is a system context diagram. The system context diagram basically says, here's the thing you are building, and this is the world around it in terms of actors, roles, personas, real users who use your system, and also the other systems that your system integrates with. In order to draw that very top-level diagram, you have to ask a bunch of questions. So what's the scope of the thing we're building? What's it doing? Who's using it? What sort of things they want to do? 
how does it fit into the wider system landscape? Again, Sandro kind of touched upon this, uh, some of this stuff as well. So a, a system context diagram is a, a nice way to scope your problem. And it's usually generally quite quick to come up with. And you do this as a part of your upfront inception phase. You use it, use it alongside impact mapping and event storming and domain analysis and DDD. You know, you've got a whole bunch of different techniques out there for doing analysis and stuff. And this is really the summary of a lot of that work. As, as developers, we want to kind of zoom into the system we're, we're building to see more detail inside it. And this is what I call a container diagram not Docker, ask me afterwards. Um, but a container diagram is basically showing the, the kind of high-level technology building blocks. So what are the applications and the data stores that come together to form our system? Is it a mobile app talking to a web app, talking to a database, sticking stuff in S3? Um, what are the responsibilities of each of these applications and data stores? So this is great if you've got a service-based architecture, for example. And you also want to focus on how these things communicate at runtime. So is it a JSON API? Is it synchronous? Is it asynchronous? Are we using a message bus? You know, the container diagram lets you focus on that very top level of design, partitioning responsibilities and functionality across your system boundary. And once you have a good way to think about describing architecture and architectural abstractions, and you get some nice diagrams, you can start to use these diagrams to spark meaningful questions. It's a feedback loop. So next time you present a bunch of diagrams to your team, if you hear questions like this, go to cformodel.com, and they can help you. So I do not want to be having conversations like, what do the colors mean? What do the arrows mean? What do you mean by this acronym? Right. So all of that notational stuff should go away. The questions I want to be having when we look at uh, diagrams is stuff like this. So you've got two Java apps, and there's an arrow between the two. How are they communicating? Is that an API call? Does that mean you've got some port open down here? Why have you got two database schemas? Why two, not one? What's your reasoning for splitting your data across these two things? I see you're using Oracle, but our standards my SQL or vice versa. And again, you can use these diagrams to challenge the design and get some real feedback. And that's the other part of this, feedback. So a number of teams who have gone through my diagramming exercise, they, they design a serverless solution. And you know, serverless is great in some contexts, but this particular set of requirements is super simple, and it doesn't really suit a serverless solution. So people draw the context diagram. It's nice and simple. We have a couple of users using our system. We have a couple of integration points, and we're done. We zoom into the technology diagram, the container diagram, and now they're trying to draw all of their serverless things. They've got like AWS lambdas kicking stuff off in DynamoDB, DynamoDB triggers kicking lambdas off, and they're, and they're trying to draw this thing. And they're like, Simon, we have a serverless solution. And it's really hard to draw. And my answer is yes. You have a complicated solution. If you have a complicated solution, your diagram is going to reflect that complexity. So your diagram is going to be complicated. And then they say to me, so what's your solution? You know, what's your, your resolution to this? And, and my answer is simplify it. <laughs> right, start merging stuff together. Think about whether you really need to split this up and have it distributed. So again, these diagrams can be a great feedback mechanism. They help us answer these two questions. We still need to work on this bottom one, and it's about risks. You know, people say, well, how do we deal with technical risks? And this is something you should factor into, again, the, the stuff that Sandro talked about, technical viability, technical feasibility. Um, people often ask me, you know, we're doing an agile thing. How do we deal with risks? And my answer is go and read the Rational Unified Process book from 20 years ago, because we solved this before. You know, front load some of the risk into your life cycle. You have to identify risks, and I have a nice little technique called risk storming. Got three steps, draw some pictures, get a bunch of people together, get them to identify risks, write them on sticky notes, stick sticky notes on the diagrams. So it's a great visual collaborative way to identify your significant risks on your solutions, either greenfield solutions or stuff you're changing, modifying, enhancing. So to really kind of wrap up, how much upfront design should we do? You know, we've got the, the throwaway answers like it depends or just enough. And that's all good, but it's not concrete advice. Again, Sandro said this, it's, a, it's an iterative incremental process. I see lots of organizations where they, they have their product people and their technology people completely separate. 
And then the product people are giving the technology people solutions. And they say, Simon, how do we stop this happening? And my answer is, get your tech people up front. So they should be there with the product owners defining the product vision, making sure that stuff is feasible. It's all iterative, it's all incremental. And I think the other way to tackle the how much upfront design should we do question is to kind of say, well, when do we stop? And for me, you stop doing upfront design when you understand what your significant architectural influencing factors are, your drivers. Your key requirements at a high level, your key quality attributes like performance and scaling and security, and the constraints of the environment in which you're working. You understand the context and scope of what you're building. So if you're able to, to draw a context diagram, you know, you're in a good place. You understand your significant design decisions in terms of modularity and technology. And again, this factors into drawing that container diagram. You have a way to create a shared vision amongst your team members. And again, this is why good diagramming is important, because it's a way to anchor us and give us a direction that we can all head in. We're confident that our design satisfies the drivers. So we dry around our architecture, maybe, or we have an architecture review, either formally or informally. We do threat modeling. We use stride. You know, there's lots of things you could do here. And you've identified and you're comfortable with the risk profile. That's it. And again, this isn't like months and years. This is hours and days and weeks. So we've gone from big design up front. Many organizations are doing nothing. I think we need to do something. This is my definition of something. Thank you very much. Do we have three minutes for questions? Yes. <laughs> Question down here. How do you initially sell this approach to the business side of a company? How do I sell this approach to the business side of the company? So uh, what's funny is I often get brought in by organizations, and it's their, it's their technology part of the organization who brings me in because they realize stuff's not happening. So we go through this with the technologists, and they kind of go, yeah, this is great. And then they invite me back, and we have like a little mini version with the business people, the product owners, the scrum masters, the testers and stuff. And we just basically summarize why is some upfront design important, what are the risks with not doing this, um, and the sorts of things that might happen in the future. So to have those conversations is the simple answer. Easier said than done. Any other questions? Right in the back. Oh, <laughs> on the on the left hand side. Um, so the, the UML tooling sucks. Is there a solution? Um, write better tooling. <laughs> um, well, you understood my, my question before, but um, we try to do. But there is a hesitance for developers to do this, mostly because it takes a lot of time to, well, particularly uh, do it in PowerPoint or whatever. That is just horrible. And you look at the UML libraries, and that is just terrible. And I, you pointed out yourself that, well, tooling is why we are not doing it. Yeah. So if there is no solution to it, then I have to write my own tooling library, which is also probably going to suck. Um, right. So yeah, I mean, because the, the tooling around things like diagramming has historically been appallingly bad, you know, UML tools have been very expensive and bloated, and, and the data entry is quite convoluted and, and time consuming, so that put lots of people off. The notations are typically ugly. You know, you've got these diagrams that look like it came from 1993 or something. Uh, lots of people are now using the stuff that's very low barrier to entry, so whiteboards, uh, tools like plant UML, so typing text, getting um, little diagrams for free, but again, we're still diagramming. I, I, I could talk about this for the next four hours. We should stop doing diagramming as an industry, and we should start doing modeling again. And I don't think I'm talking about big, heavyweight UML modeling. I'm talking about lean, lightweight modeling. So if you're interested, I have some tooling called Structurizer. 
um, which is it's a, it's a, a very lightweight modeling tool specifically designed to, to create the diagrams from the C4 model. So that's my approach. Um, I have a bunch of customers who really like that, um, and some people don't. And, and in fact, some organizations I work with, they've taken the C4 concept, and they have built their own tooling inside, in, inside their organizations. So I, I actually think there's lots of opportunities for tooling in the future. Okay, I think we're um, unfortunately out of time, but uh, thank you very much, Simon. Thank you. Thank you.